So first of all, Musa's slides will be available on the Kasdan website. And I, as I said, I think the table where you looked at simulations of refinances depending on the origination date was particularly useful and people should consult with that. Is they're looking at the market more broadly, basically how much damage is going to happen as a result of the need to refinance. We have a great panel. Again, if you go to the website, you can find bios. I'm just gonna say who they are. Uh, Jamie Lee, Chief Executive Officer of the Jamison Group of Companies, who is very local here, does a lot of work in Koreatown. Um, Marco Sessa, Principal and Partner um, of Land Development and Residential for Sudbury Properties. Marco, thank you for being here, and he's our San Diego expert. And Kitty Wallace, um, Senior Executive Vice President for Greater Los Angeles at Colliers, uh, perhaps the leading uh, multifamily broker here in Southern California. So I actually have a bunch of questions for Musa too, but I, I want to just start with the panel. Just what's your re what do you think rents are going to do in the next year or two? Just based on on the ground, what you're seeing. And let's just start with, we never start with San Diego, so let's start with San Diego for once. I, I, based on my read of the report, it seems pretty spot on. Um, you know, we had pretty impressive rent increases in 2021 and 22. Those slowed significantly this summer. Um, we were raising rents through basically June and had a dip in July. We had a little bit of a recovery again in August, but right now we've seen the last six weeks where we've actually dropped rents a little bit. We'll still end the year significantly higher, but we're back into a little bit more traditional seasonal winter lowering and summer increases, which we didn't see at all during COVID. In COVID, we never saw reductions at all. In the fall, we always have had a little bit slower traffic and going into winter. The two years of COVID or post-COVID, we didn't see that at all. And that was a lot of our rent increases. And I, so Musa made a comment that he was surprised that the weakest market was coastal city of San Diego. Do you think that's Correct? Is that what you're observing I, I, relative to the rest of the area? I mean, I think that coastal San Diego has a lack of new supply. So you have an older product that doesn't have institutional uh, management and some of the more sophisticated tools oh, okay. on revenue management software and so on. And so I think some of that is what you see in a lot of the growth right now in San Diego is in the central part of San Diego. Um, the planning department has done a good job passing a, a zoning ordinance called Complete Communities that allows you to find an existing piece of property. And as long as you do 40% affordable of the base density, you can go up to an 8 FAR. And that program now... So, so give the trade-off again. How much has to be affordable? So you do 40% 40%. of what the base density is. But you might have had a base density of 29 units to the acre, and all of a sudden you can bump that up to an 8 FAR. They've also done some fee um, breaks if you build a 500 or smaller square foot unit. And so there's a little bit of an increase this year in number of new permits. A lot of those are 500 square foot units, studio units, and small units. And so what we're looking at an increase in number of housing units per se, the amount of folks that those units can house is also somewhat reduced because a lot of it is really small. And with limited parking and in urban areas that have services. So does that calibration work? Is it worth setting aside 40% if you're getting 8X FAR? Is that basically well, the so I mean, the it, depending on the original zoning, you have certain properties where the, the amount of affordable can actually end up being less than what the inclusionary requirement would have been if the higher base density was already there. Interesting. Okay. Kitty? Oh, I, you know, I think the forecast on the rent forecast was probably dead on. And I think it has to do a lot with what transpired during COVID. You know, we had Los Angeles shut down. We weren't able to raise rents. We still aren't able to raise rents until February for the vast majority of our units. So our rents have been flat. So the Inland Empire took people from Orange County, San Diego, Los Angeles. So you saw that big bump and spike in the IE, and that's where rents were going. Rents have now gone up double digit in the Inland Empire for the past couple of years. Now we're seeing those flatten. We're also seeing a lot of new construction out in the IE, which we haven't in very many years. 
So we're seeing supply come, and we're seeing this nationally. We're seeing this also take place in the Nashvilles of the world, the Texases, the Arizonas of the world, where people fled California during COVID for more affordable housing. They've left. The people came. They raised the rents double digit each of those years while we sat with flat rents. And now they're, they're starting to come back because they're saying, now I'm paying the same rent I pay in Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego. I'll leave the Inland Empire. I'm going to leave Texas. I'm going to come back to where I'm going, where there's jobs and everything else. So we will also see, I think, Los Angeles, when we can do our rent increases in February, you know, pick up some speed. And then Orange County and San Diego have just been consistently strong. I think people came there. You still get the weather. You still get a great quality of life. So I think some of those individuals may not be coming back to Los Angeles. So I think greater Los Angeles will just be larger. But I think we'll see a little bit more softening in the empire. The job growth has primarily been in the lower income job growth. Um, and the buildings that you're building there are higher income. So things like San Diego is doing to add more affordable housing is going to be helpful all around because just adding housing supply helps affordability. Even if you're adding high-end housing, any housing that you add to the supply, and I think we're going to run into a big challenge in, U in Los Angeles with ULA. I think no one's going to build in the city of Los Angeles if you're going to get taxed 5.5% on your exit. It's like you have an equity partner who gave you no money. So Los Angeles is going to see you know, a worsening of our affordability index, and we'll see people in the vicinities. Jamie? Yeah, the report looked great to me um, as far as what <clears throat> being reflective of what we're seeing on the ground. I have a very myopic view. In Los Angeles, we've got properties from West LA to downtown Hollywood through Koreatown, but the vast concentration of our focus is in Koreatown, Los Angeles. I think Wilshire Boulevard from Wilton to Hoover, essentially 6th Street down to 8th Street. And you know, slow, arguably sluggish rent growth, but existent rent growth. And that's spot on with what Musa was talking about. And I think we are seeing that moving forward in, in, into the future. We delivered 500 units this year fully absorbed, but that increased sense of competition among properties does create that little you know, softening of the rent growth that you may otherwise see if we weren't producing units. We're delivering over 1,000 units next year. So it'll be an interesting time. So I wonder if it, so I want to ask Bruce, could we get his slides back up there? Because there's one slide I want to come back to, if possible. And Richard, while he's doing that, I'm going to, since we're in downtown LA, I will say that Moose's forecast is downtown LA rent growth is bad, which <coughs> is, downtown LA is not great, but there are pockets inside downtown LA that are promising, so the arts district, the financial district. Some areas are harder hit, but in downtown, there are some pockets of places where the 25 to 35 year old wants to come. We're Orange seeing County. things, we're seeing light in LA, maybe not here quite yet, but coming. So when you say it's bad, it, you don't mean that he's wrong. You mean he's that right. He's right. I'm just saying just inside. It, it is. Overall, you know, downtown yeah. LA was, you know, we're, we have negative rent growth in a lot of our pockets in downtown LA. Okay. We are, uh, our rents are not where they were in 2019. The Orange County. But rent there are certain growth. sub pockets that are doing well. Okay. I, I want to. The reason I want to hit Orange County rent growth is, yes. I mean, th thank you very much. I mean, you look and as Ked, this is what I said we got wrong is we were saying it would grow 10 percent and it grew 20. Um, so I have a, a couple of, so that is an extraordinary graph. It kind of looks like, you know, Manhattan in the middle and Brooklyn on one side and Jersey on the other, actually. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. One is, so one's a technical question that probably only you and I will care about, and the other is a, a, a business-related question, is how much of, do you think the forecast growth in Orange County is a result, sort of residual to the fact that you had this extraordinary growth over this two-year period of time. And it's just the model sort of running that through. And that's the less important question. The more important question is, does this mean that Orange County really has nothing to worry about in terms of this refinance problem that's coming? Because you know, you're looking at 20% growth for two years. That's a 40% uptick. Um, I think you need 16% growth per year yeah, or something you need, like that. You need 16% if those loans were originated, let's say, three years ago. For loans that were originated, let's say, seven years ago, probably in Orange County, they will be fine, but not so in Los Angeles or... No, I understand that, but this is an important distinction in terms of thinking about the market going forward, right, okay. is it means that you're not going to see properties come on the market because people have to sell. You're not going to see dilution of equity in Orange County 
relative to any of the other markets, I think. I don't think any place else has this kind of picture. Less delusion of equity in Orange yeah. County, definitely. But again, I mean, how serious this problem is, I want to hear from the panel. Is this something that people worry about, and, or are banks more accommodating to work this, through with, work, work this out with you know, property owners? Well, I, you know, our experience during the last downturn was that banks were a lot more com accommodating than in the past. Um, and the expectation and through relationships is that they will be in the future. We are not sitting in a position where we have a whole bunch of stuff that's maturing. We have a couple smaller projects that are going to go through uh, delivery and absorption through and into 24. Um, and that one may have some challenges with that coverage, but we're doing like you suggested. We're all squirreling cash away for the reality of that project. We've been fortunate that, you know, I sat over here in 2002 as an embred when we came out and we were able to build a fair amount of, of multifamily in, in 2010 time frame. All of that stuff has doubled in value, has had doubling of rent growth. We have been paying mortgages down. So we're sitting on projects that even if we have to refinance at slightly higher rates, it, it fits your graph. But, you know, we've even paid debt down and, you know, the operating expense, it's a little more than rent growth, right? I mean, the last couple of years have seen significant operational expenses, on, and not just on insurance, but just our own staff, internal stuff to, to operate the project. Um, energy this last year was a killer. Um, you know, we've seen double-digit growth in electricity and gas uh, costs. I know there's a sustainable discussion that's coming, I think, later on in, in this conference, but... So how to hop, that's where our focus is right now, is operationally how to be more efficient. Yeah, you had a sensitivity chart on the refi, depending on the vintage of the loan. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, as you were pegging how much rent growth had to be in order to cover that mm -hmm. future debt service, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think that that also took into account the increase of operating expenses that you had to make up for, like an additional additive rental uh, rate definitely. that you had to take into account. So it's even high, it's even worse. <laughs> it's, it's even worse with operating expenses. Yes, and insurance agree. here has been the killer and the labor costs have been very, very significant. So I think that's what we're concerned about. But I feel like, you know, agency debt is very accessible. I think with our partnerships, um, you know, maybe it is just kicking the can down the road and paying down a little bit. Certainly with the rates the way they are, it's much more painful than it was. Um, when rents were going 13 to 15% in mid-city LA, we didn't have such pressure on our operating expenses and markets were so much more yeah. freely open. Yeah, I had a question on that. 120 million that are coming to maturity in 24, um, what is that as a percentage of the overall multifamily debt? I mean, it's still a pretty small amount. Even though that's a big, 120 no, 80, billion. You know, 80 billion, it's going to be multifamily. But Jamie just raised a very good point. We did mention it in our report. I didn't mention it in the presentation. Most of the multifamily loan is from agency, right. close to 50%. And that's going to help quite a lot. Yeah. So whatever the agencies decide basically will dictate what's going to happen in multifamily at least. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I, th I think you're going to go back and see. If you go back two cycles, right? People didn't want to give their, you, you ran into a problem, you didn't want to give your property back. So people worked through not giving their properties back. Today, people are like, look, if I'm not making my money, if you're a syndicate, you need to add more money. They're like, I'm not putting good money after bad, or you have a deal and it's dead. They're like, you know what? Last time I gave my money, gave my properties back, I didn't have a problem. So they're happy to give things back, which has banks working with or service, special services working in particular people in the office building. I think on our multifamily, we have a much softer landing and we have, you know, we have our, our values haven't dropped 50 plus percent. We're not vacant buildings. So properties that are mid construction and you know, the developer left, that's gonna be a problem asset. Our multifamily assets that are working, you know, the good real estate, I think might be like Jamie mentioned, it might be a cash, a slight cash in refinance. Uh, possibly, and if it's not, 
I think these special services are going to take the properties back and they're going to keep them and they'll sell them at a time when they're going to make money on them. That's what we saw the last round, is the servicers said, I'll take that property back, I'll hold it, I'll fix that, and I'll turn around. So we didn't see a lot of foreclosures and bad properties that are coming back. We will see clients, and we are seeing now, a lot of clients who are having problems because they bought with debt fund money two, three years ago, and they, were, they had a business plan to move out tenants, raise rents X amount of time, double digits every single year, and then you couldn't raise rents at all. So now you have interest rates that are seven and a half percent. They bought at three and a half percent with an anticipation that their rent roll would be double that it is today, and it's the same as it was three years ago. And you have people who didn't pay during that time period, so there will be some pain during that time period. But much less, I think, than, than what we'll see, and I think that you know, if there's good real estate to be had, especially if it's an agency loan, I think the special services hold that, fix that, and sell that at par. And that's probably the key, actually, to this entire question, is the flexibility of your timing. Yeah. And so if you're, you know, operating, you're executing on an investment thesis, you've got to close your fund, you have to, whatever it may be, then you're going to run up against more issue. But for me, it's like there's nothing pushing me to sell. Correct. There's and nothing pushing me to, you know, we have incredible flexibility on timing, so we just wait. Yeah, and, and there's a Keep vast the amount of people just like Jamie. So we did a $200 million portfolio sale 10 years ago. And if you purchase that portfolio, you're a top 20 owner in LA because we're bifurcated in Los Angeles. There's not, it's not like in New York where there's five families who own the vast majority of Los Angeles. So we have a lot of smaller private family offices who aren't on an IRR basis. And if you are, then there's all these investors who'd like to be in LA or Southern California who don't want to put money in yet, but they're happy to give prep equity, mes debt. So there's creative solutions for the person who said, look, I spent a lot of time, effort, and energy. I still like my business plan. I'll borrow some money from someplace else. And there's a tremendous amount of that prep equity, mes debt in the market to get themselves into real estate without actually purchasing it. So there'll be creative solutions. And we've also seen, though, equity investors it's like this, all they want is a crazy deal, like you're so <laughs> desperate, and we haven't seen any like reasonableness enter into the marketplace at all, which is why we're not really seeing comps, or we're, yeah. seeing, we're seeing poor comps that either can't get financing and won't close, but people are looking for just absolute you know, bottom of the barrel deals, and sellers aren't at that place yet, so it's this persistent bid-ask spread that we've been talking about for the last five years. We are doing a tremendous amount of business, and if you take a, a pool of buyers and we want to sell a building, you know, you want 100% of the buyers looking. And in a regular market, maybe, you know, okay, it's not my market, I don't want you. You're kind of working with maybe 60, 70% of the buyers because they don't want it for whatever reason. This four years of COVID, we've been working with like 25% of the buyer pool. We're probably working with 10 because 90% of them want just what, what Jamie is saying. They want to buy a seven cap in LA, I'm like, look, our prices are down 20% from where they were. They're not gonna be 50%. You're not getting a seven cap on good real estate. You can get a seven cap on bad real estate we don't wanna own. But on good real estate, there's this bid-ask spread. So you, what you're finding is this very small pool of buyers that are, it was either the 1031 exchange buyers who had money through October. It's the buyer who owns next door, who's like, look, I've tried to buy that for years. There's usually 30 offers and now, there's none, so I can get that deal at an exceptional basis. I can't build. Jamie, you can't build for the price I'm selling new construction for today in Los Angeles. So all the institutions are waiting on sideline. They're going to wait till the bottom hits. And once the bottom hits, they're going to jump in, and it's going to go like this very expeditiously. So now it's these private family offices who are saying, I'll take that long term. I like that play. But it's a, it's a, we'll get 20 bad offers and two that are here. But let me tell you, in 2010 and 2011, some of the best real estate deals were, were made in that time frame. So if you can get good real estate in these markets, and a lot of my clients 10 years ago who left LA and they went to Arizona and Nashville, a lot of them have sold there and they're coming back because they see this basis place. So it's like you've got to sit out this interest rate deal for a time period. Mm -hmm. And if you can figure that out, there's deals to be had. So I, I want to follow up on a couple of these comments. So first of all, um, on sales prices and cap rates, is I was looking. If you look at the NAE REIT, uh, you can find the implied cap rate for every property type within REITs. And right now, for multifamily, it's six percent. 
national, and you, I, you threw out seven. <laughs> so is like the implied cap rate from REITs, do you think that's uh, an upper bound of what the cap rate should be, about average of what it should be, or a lower bound of what it should be? Do you, think it, do you think it overstates, it understates, or is it about top. right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the very top that it should you think, yeah, yeah. I, I agree that it's the, t it, it's the top. And so that's yeah. what the people are looking at. The market is actually saying the real cap rate is still something under six, right? If the NARIT implied rate is six, six Correct. percent at the, the moment. The issue is people are saying, well, my interest rate's seven, and I don't want negative leverage. It's like, well, you know what? Good real estate's always been negative leverage, and this is a short-term challenge. So it, <laughs> these, these people the aren't buying. These <laughs> people who want the seven cap, Richard, aren't buying. This is just the person who's saying, I want positive leverage. It's like, well, hang out. Maybe you can go find it in some other state in some really bad market that you don't want to own that real estate at. Yeah, but. those are the low-ball offers we see, but we're not transacting <laughs> on it. Yes. So I can't help but I see Lynn, you shaking your head at this. So Lynn, can you share here any <laughs> thoughts you have? I would say that what we're seeing in the market as we're actually tra pricing things and bidding on things is that exactly what they're saying. In secondary locations where there are challenges, then we're seeing people want to say that's the cap rate or that's what they want the appraisal to come back, but no, nothing is trading at those cap rates. Like literally, like nothing. It's either just not happening and they'll figure out another way or you know, lenders are having to get involved, but they're not going through as traditional transactions. And I would say where there are stronger market fundamentals and stronger asset types, we're still seeing cap rates that start with, even with that, something that starts with a five. And that's where people feel like they're really getting a great deal. They will buy unleveraged. They're like, you know what, relative to where this, this would have traded in another time, I like the basis, and I'm fine with setting my basis at this and writing it for the long term. So we're not seeing that six to seven. It's, it's just not happening. We're transacting some deals at fours as oh, well. Oh, so you're not disagreeing with what? I mean, we're saying six is a ceiling. It's, it's whatever the right rating is, it's below that. I'm saying you'll see the appraisal there. I don't know where you're seeing the transaction. Okay. Well, um, the other thing is, you know, that, that's very provocative, something Kitty said, is about seeing people moving back to L.A. And, you know, I think we're all L.A. cheerleaders here. <laughs> but I also hear everybody talk about how horrible L.A. is as a place to do business. And so, I mean, what is it? Is it the, the, the sun tax? People have decided, yeah, it's, it's really worth it. Or, um, or are the horrible things more horrible than the, the benefits of being here? And, you know, I could go through a list of the bad things, but I'm not, you, we all know what I'm, we're talking it. about here. Like, why did everybody yeah. turn and look at me? <laughs> I mean, clearly it couldn't be, the bad can't outweigh the good because we're still here. And there's absolutely nothing that's convincing me that any other city in this country is a better place to live. So, does, this, does the gentleman from San Diego have I, anything I, to say about that? Yeah, I, he, hasn't, look, I, I, he, he hasn't come close to convincing me. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was a hard time to just get him on the freeway to leave San Diego to come. I, I even drove up last night because be I didn't want to deal with it this morning. But look, I live, I live a block from the beach. I walk the dog on the beach every day. I, within a two hour drive, can be in snow. I can be in surf. I can pretty much do anything I want. Yeah, LA um, people have that also. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, but tell us a little bit, you know, in San Diego, so, so one of the things we find very frustrating here in um, LA is the permitting process. So even if you have a buy right development, just getting through plan check can take a very long period here. And I always like to contrast us to put pressure on the planning people in LA with Singapore where it takes about three weeks to get a permit. Um, so long as you're doing by right. Um, but also very what, inflexible. What is the process like? Inflexible <laughs> plan, though, uh, in I've Singapore, been, too, it's, though. What, like, it's, fully it's, inflexible in the plan. Yeah, no, no, in no, Singapore. But, but, but they change their zoning every yes. five years. So, yeah. you know. Uh, but, but what is it like in San Diego? What, uh, it just in, in terms they of, have made the discretionary process significantly easier. There's different avenues to navigate that. But the building permit process is still really slow. And the last two years when everybody was virtual uh, and still into some regards is, has been really difficult. Small tenant improvement permits for your retailer on the base of a multifamily building. Some of those permits are taking a year, right? And 
In some cases, we have leases with those folks that start at a set date, even whether they have a permit or finish their TIs or not, and that's been really difficult for some of the smaller tenants to get open. Um, the, we have just like, I mean, we have a group collecting signatures right now in San Diego for a 6.5% transfer tax over 25 million, right? And so some of the things that are occurring here are coming down to San Diego. Uh, the business community and trade associations are working to try, to try to keep that off the ballot, but there's likely that that happens in November. We have all of the state measures with rent control coming. so. Um, there is a lot of folks that want housing, say all the right things about delivering housing, but honestly can't get out of their own way in the permitting process, and you're still dealing with minutia that is totally unnecessary. So I, I do want to come back to the, um, are we going to grow again, or are we going to continue to shrink? And Moose and I were yesterday looking at Postal Service data, which is some of the most current moving data available. And the great thing about Postal Service data is it's not a survey. It's every address in the United States. And the downside of Postal Service data, and this is going to be important, is it doesn't track foreign moves. So countries, people leaving the US and people coming um, from outside the US into our cities. And what was striking to me is three of the 10 cities with the most outflow in the first five, was it the first five months, I think, of 2023? Or the first seven or the something? The first seven months. First seven months of 2023. Three of the five, three of the top 10 cities in terms of outflow were in Texas. Dallas, Houston, Austin were all in the top 10. And they all had similar numbers to LA, about 7,000. Um, which, given that LA is a much larger city than any of those places, means that it's a share. Um, you had more people moving out, but that's domestic. And given how much Houston and LA in particular attract foreign migration, that suggests that LA may be growing again, that, that very small number of out migrants. But what's, what's particularly striking is if you go back, um, and, and this is in the report, 20, 2020, 2020, 2021. You had enormous out migration from Los Angeles, and you had enormous in migration into these Texas cities. And that's changed, is there is more of an equilibrium, at least between and, these and places. And by the way, Richard, to add fuel to that fire, you can build nilly willy out in Texas, right? So we were seeing the out migration, we were seeing people moving there, and then they've been building there. So it got more expensive, and then people are now leaving. It's not only difficult to build in Los Angeles, as we've just discussed, but you know, it, you've got CEQA, you've got the neighbors, you've got the cost of construction, you have all that, but just the permitting and the time and the people to, to get someone to, to put a place where you're gonna put your meters, it's six oh, months yeah. to a year, right? I mean, you know, I, so. I, I do think nationally you saw a <laughs> outflow months, out of cities into <laughs> suburbs, <laughs> yeah. right? And yeah. so some of that data, depending on whether or where you're drawing the circle or where they're going. No, it, it, and it is those cities. It's not it the metropolitan yeah. areas. That's so true. So LA, do we, it's, Southern California needs to get, rather than adding more transfer tax, because they don't see it. They're thinking, oh, this is good. It's like, no, it's not good. What's good is more housing, because the right. price of housing goes down when you have more of it. It's supply demand. So rather than San Diego saying, well, that's a great idea, let's add, and by the way, I think that's gonna go nationwide. I, I believe it's gonna get reversed on our ballot when we say that you, have to, you can't tax yourself without a two-thirds majority, and then that will stop the nationwide spread of what started in New York and San Francisco and these transfer taxes. But until that happens, we have to withhold. But I think these cities need to get smarter and say, look, you don't, we don't need to be no zoning and build an apartment next to a gas station like you do in Houston, but, but let's build quality real estate in the right spots and make it more expeditious so that we can make housing more affordable because people want to come back and the largest challenge we have is if, you, if you're an employer and you want to start a business, you need to have affordable housing. So some of our clients, like they own here and they're like, okay, well, I'm going to move all of my accounting over to Arizona, because I can pay my accountant in Arizona $40,000. In LA, I have to pay him $100,000. And my real estate's more expensive, so I'll have my office here, but my accounting staff's going to be in Arizona. Although I have to say, even if I'm living in Arizona, I'm not hiring a $40,000 a year accountant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I don't, 60. I don't want to be audited. We, we build all our products, so everything is new construction. Our, 
the, the building typologies in the suburbs also can be a lot less expensive to deliver. You know, I mentioned the 500 units going up in San Diego at an 8 FAR building. Well, that, you know, we can't get an 8 FAR out of wood, and so that gets you into concrete. If you do do it in wood, it's a really complicated, expensive building to deliver. Right? Out, I could go to Riverside and build a three-story slab on grade walk-up with surface parking and I, I deliver that unit for half the price as I did maybe in an urban environment. Right? The rent isn't half as much. So let me, I, I want to ask one more question. It relates to typologies, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, so every city in Southern California has a problem with dead office buildings. Um, work from home is here to stay. The median number of days people are going to be at the office is three. I'm pretty sure about this now. There's a guy at Stanford named Nick Bloom who's done great work on this. Turns out that's the most productive arrangement is three days a week in the office. Um, so in light of that, right, there are opportunities. You could look at them as ad adaptive reuse or maybe they're just covered land plays and you tear down the office building and replace it with something else. We have an expert on uh, adaptive reuse here on the panel. What do you, how important do you think, and I'll open it up to anyone to answer this, is that going to be an important source of housing in the years to come? And is let me is just that start. going to be? A big how, how important will that be? Yeah, how important will it be? Housing? Yeah. Uh, I think it can be very significant if people would do it, but we've been talking about adaptive reuse I've been seeing it pretty consistently on the headlines and on panels like this for the last five years. Uh, really, really came to a head in the pandemic. We've been doing it for 10 years now. So we've converted eight buildings, about 1,800 units. We are under construction on four more right now. We're working through a process to get under construction on two and we probably have maybe three or four more buildings after that. And, and that was the whole thing about Los Angeles as well, because when you enter into a multifamily development um, era and it begins with office conversion and the office buildings that you're starting with are in Los Angeles and you have to execute your business plan in Los <laughs> Angeles. So on the one hand, I'm tied to the land that way because our office portfolio existed here in LA. And then as we move through the development process, it really became, you know, the devil you know is better than the one you don't. And we know how to do it here. And we've executed on this business plan. And then on top of that, only one third of our developments are adaptive reuse conversions. Two thirds of them are ground up. So now we've built out this, you know, ground up pipeline and, and business as well. Um, I think it's incredibly significant. I think even the some of the buildings, for instance, and this is where it really becomes situational, is we took all the buildings where like these are perfect floor plates. These are perfect floor plates. Adaptive reuse buildings are typically high rise because these are high rise office buildings. So you have these great views. So the rent becomes there's a lot of parity in the rents from adaptive reuse, even though it's you know originally in 1960s shell, older building, compared to like a type three brand new building. We're getting the same rates. Um, so just a quick, if, if, if the office building was built in 1960 and you've turned it residential recently, is it covered by rent stabilization or is it not? No, adaptive reuse is not. But we do all of the structural, we have to redo all the building systems, et cetera. So after you get through the structure, the seismic work, um, then it's an expensive TI. I mean, we really saw in this era downtown, people were spending 150, 200 bucks a foot on office TIs, and you've got to turn that every five to seven years. It, th this is why we're completely upside down in DTLA. We've been pushed back 15 years in, in downtown, but we spend the same to convert it to an apartment building, and it's fully amenitized, and all you do is repaint it when the tenant moves out. So. On top of that, you know, we were holding at mid-teens, 20% vacancy across the board in office, and you're getting not as great rents, um, and a lot of those for us were full service gross, whereas on the resi side, we're 98% occupied. That's a triple net lease and a higher rate. So overall, it just makes sense, but um, we're, what we're seeing now is you have a tower that is starting to lose occupancy in those office tenants. 
Um, we never thought that that floor plate was great, but guess what? When you have to <laughs> convert a building, you can make it work. So there's a lot of flexibility and planning that you can use with getting buildings that aren't exactly perfect and exactly super efficient to become good apartment buildings. How much more difficult has it been, though, the adaptive reuse you did eight, 10 years ago that worked to now? with the city involvement in adding the fire department and things, how much more costly was that on a per foot basis to convert eight years ago to today if the dollar were the same? Well, eight years ago, we didn't know what we were doing. Okay. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and that's the thing, fair, it's, it's not so easy. Now I would say everything is very streamlined and very easy. We know exactly how the units need to be shaped. The fun thing about adaptive reuse, the fun thing, is that you open up a wall and it's like, oh, there's a vault here. We didn't know. <laughs> you open up something and like, oh, a tenant like drilled a hole, a giant hole in the middle of the floor and installed something. So you're really coming at it as an existing living building. Uh, the other point I'd like to make it, it's more sustainable than knocking down and demolishing the entire office building, re-excavating into ground and potentially disrupting who knows what, finding water. There's like a whole bunch of invisible rivers underneath <laughs> LA that nobody knows about, but we hit water sometimes. Um, so it's more sustainable to do that. We reutilize the existing parking structure. You're not building all of that new stuff, but it's, I mean, it's certainly way more expensive just because construction costs and labor costs have gone up, you know, averaging like anywhere from 8 to 15% every year since then. So from that aspect, it's more expensive. But from a streamlining and understanding what we're doing and then having cooperation from the city, but the, you know, the fire department's going to be what the fire department's <laughs> going to be, nothing has changed. Yeah. Their DWP, nothing has changed. Well, you've got there, expertise. But. It's just hard to get that expertise in Los Angeles. So yes, I think yes. we need to convert a lot of these things. And so we had like a the redevelopment agency in downtown Los Angeles. So when we converted a bunch of adaptive reuse and said, right, you don't have downtown. to use parking, mm -hmm. you know, that helped spur what happened in downtown Los Angeles. I think people look at these office buildings and there's a collection that all walk and you can walk them. And as you say, it's like this, yeah. this works out nicely or this one does not. You know, one of my, we did a adaptive reuse, probably the first one we brokered was a deal with high rise in Beverly Hills, same thing, because you got a multi over the height. But when you walk these things, it's expensive and the city becomes, comes in and causes havoc and we need to grow that expertise. So I, I think if cities and municipalities said, let's help spur growth, especially in like a San Francisco where they really need people to be in that downtown area in downtown Los Angeles, if we had some of that and gave some monies and funds, it might make it easier for someone to get your expertise. Because what I'm finding is, even just to build ground up construction, the two of you are suggesting, it's much more difficult and takes much more time. So some of my clients who are some of our best developers in LA or Southern California are like, I'm done. Right? So we're losing, because it's so hard. They're like, I'd rather just buy new construction at a lower basis than go through that process. So we need to find a way to make it easier. Right. And so, and so let me, um, so we have about five minutes for q and A. I'm really into the affordable housing and trying to figure out that disconnect. I did a thesis on it in college. Um, where do you primarily see the disconnect between developers, owners, asset managers, that side of it, and the city? Because we saw with ULA, they projected at least a couple hundred million in sales, getting that revenue. When I think it was like 50 million, it only incentivized less sales. Where could you guys believe a solution could come to terms of because even as Jamie mentioned, there is so much capital in LA, there probably is as much as New York in some ways, but we don't see the development. We aren't seeing high rises and more necessarily in that aspect. What could the city be doing to get to that point? Well, and I'll address this is happening live in San Diego. We, um, the last election elected a number of pro-housing Democrats. Um, those folks, the first couple years, passed a number of rules that were positive for the industry. Um, just Tuesday, just yesterday, or I'm sorry, Monday night, they voted down uh, a housing measure that had a whole bunch of things that the mayor's office and a bunch of us in the industry had advocated for. And it, it really was a weird hearing, but you're, you have another election coming up and the electorate is resistive to some of the things that were being brought forward with some of these streamlining measures. So unless there's political will to do it, there's a little bit that can be done. And unfortunately right now, the political will says a lot of good things and is getting enough pushback where they're now beginning to shy back away from it. 
which is a little disappointing. Jamie? You're, you mean capital A affordable housing, right? Everybody here is in business, right? People in business are incentivized by different things. You need to create a system of incentives that aligns the goals between developers and people who produce real estate with people who want more affordable housing. There are many, many, many things that are wrong with the system that I don't even, I'm having trouble even knowing where to start. <laughs> um, even the scale of affordable housing, um, well here, let me start with something that's successful, transit-oriented communities. That TOC program is very, very successful because we've built over 500 affordable units that we otherwise would not have built, but what did we get in return? We got bonus density. And because we build on Wilshire Boulevard, every single one of our buildings is in one of these tiers for transit-oriented communities. So we are building affordable units that are inside our existing market rate office buildings. They're all sitting on top of metro stations at Normandy, um, Western, Vermont, et cetera. Um, and, and then we lease out and, and maintain those affordable units. One of the major issues that we've seen is the vast majority of our units are extremely low income, which means you are making 30% or less AMI. If you have a full-time job, you don't qualify for those units. And if you get a full-time job, you lose your apartment. <laughs> this is a system that is completely broken in the incentives that it's creating not only for the developers and for the government, but for the people living in those apartments. So we are only able to lease out basically to fixed income, like seniors, or maybe, you know, definitely not people with two um, wage earners in that scenario. And, you know, I'd love to see a system where we're incentivizing people to improve their lot in life so that if they get a full-time job or they get a raise or, I don't know, they win the lottery, that they can keep their apartment and maybe that apartment grows with them. And then when they move out, you can set it back down to the ELI level something like that. So all of our units are ELI, VLI. So those are very difficult to even find tenants for. So we're talking about this emergency of like, we need more affordable housing for all these people who are housing insecure and might lose their apartment at any moment. And yet we can't even find people who are qualified to like rent these. On top of that, it takes so many months that I don't know how these people are like sustaining themselves in the meantime while they're trying to work through this city of LA um, LAHD paperwork process, back and forth, back and forth, asking for all sorts of complicated documents that a lot of these tenants don't know how to even secure. So that's <laughs> this whole thing that I have a problem with. If you're talking about like 100% AMI, 120%, if you're talking like workforce housing, that's a bit easier, but they still have to go through this really bureaucratic grind to like find their units. <laughs> And so I think when you look at a system of incentives like TOC, where people are actually building, they're utilizing it. Like you want to build programs that people will actually use. And so I'll make a plug for the citywide adaptive reuse ordinance in that if we want to take these half empty, you know, dilapidated office buildings or underutilized office buildings, turn them into housing, that housing will inherently be more lowercase a affordable and in downtown centers, because that's where office buildings are in working centers, then we need to create a program and a system that allows people to build the types of units that they think are marketable, and not the types of units that a government thinks is marketable. Because right now, in the ordinance, you have um, average square footage requirements. So all of the units have to be an average 750 square feet. That doesn't work in today's market, and that doesn't work in an urban environment that's way too big of a unit. So we need flexibility there. We need flexibility on the parking requirements, et cetera. And so I think there's a lot to dig into. And let me put in a plug, the Lusk Center did a study on transit-oriented communities about two years ago. If you, it was funded by the Haynes Foundation. So if you Google Lusk Center TOC, you will find the definitive study on, yeah. on transit-oriented communities. Because in the meantime, there are great affordable housing developers, but the vast majority of those projects are very small. And so yeah. if you have you know, 65,000 people sleeping on the street every day, you can't build 30 unit buildings at a time. And the, oper the increase to operating expenses are really yes. hitting the affordable community. Yeah. So let's take one more question and then, yes sir, over here. Regarding the, regarding the forecast, uh, 
Is there any consideration for legislative roadblocks, specifically rent control? Because especially in some of the, the, high, the projected high uh, rent growth areas, you have cities like Santa Ana and, and Inglewood, which have pretty restrictive legislative, uh, legislation on them. I mean, we don't uh, directly control for that. It's really outside of our model. But uh, as long as it's already priced in rent, we kind of capture that a little bit. So we only capture basically legacy leg regulations, but not new regulations as such. We don't really capture that. And, and the other thing, I mean, because of Costa Hawkins, there's vacancy CD control in California. So this is only, a part, we're only looking at apartments that are available for rent when yeah. we model this stuff. So yeah. rent stabilization will not affect that even in Santa Ana in Inglewood, yeah. right? It, it's not, somebody's staying in the unit, sh sure. So your pro forma should reflect that, right? Yeah. But if people move out, then, it, and if any, I mean, the, the evidence is that when you have rent stabilization, uh, when stuff does go on the market at the market rate, it's actually more expensive it's because you've restricted the supply yeah. as a result of that. Yeah. So um, with that, uh, we need to move on to our terrific keynote speaker, but let me thank again our wonderful panel of Jamie. <laughs>